we move to our first keynote speech entitled Vision 2030, Reimagining the Future of Digital Learning Engagement by Professor Carr Kapp. This session will be moderated by our e-learning manager, Mr. Hasnain Zafar. Now, I would like to invite Mr. Hasnain Zafar to begin the session. So that's great. So I have been informed that Prof. Kalkup already joined uh, our event. Thank you, Prof. Kalkup. Uh, let, let, let me, it's, it's a great pleasure to actually you know, uh, moderate this session and having Prof. Karl Kup, I've been actually following him on social media for so many years and it's a pleasure that today I'm going to actually moderate his session. So let me introduce Prof. Karl Kup. Uh, Prof. Karl Kup is an in international speaker, scholar, writer, and expert on the convergence of learning technology and business with a focus on game thinking, games and gamification for learning. He serves as a professor of instructional technology at Bloomsburg University in Bloomsburg and serves as the director of university, University Institute for Interactive Technologies. He is an award-winning professor and author uh, of eight books, including the best-selling the gamification of learning and instruction and play to learn. He has received several industry awards, including the ATD Distinguished Contribution to Talent Development Award in year 2019, and has been a TEDx speaker and author of several LinkedIn learning courses, including how uh, learning how to increase learner engagement that's where we are actually having facing challenges nowadays, how to engage learners. So he believes that play, creativity, and game thinking lead to innovation, productivity, and profitability. Uh, so may I ask Prof. Kalka to on your camera and let's see. Yeah, hi, Prof. Kalka, good morning. I'm hi, good morning. Hi, hi, How, how's everyone today? Everyone, okay. I'm not sure what is the time there, you know? <laughs> Very, uh, so it's uh, nine o'clock at night. So oh, I see. Uh, so good night uh, to you. Uh, yes. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. <laughs> so that's good. That's good. So um, just about to get started. So thank everyone for. So just want me to jump in. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, oh, we, great. Yeah. So thank you everyone for having me. I'm very excited to be here, and I want to talk about what the future looks like for uh, education in 2030. So just a quick uh, recap of 2020, uh, which hasn't really been that good <laughs> in terms of uh, what's been going on with a lot of uh, crazy things here in um, <clears throat> the States and I'm sure in other places <laughs> as well. So, um, but there's a lot of good things that are happening in learning and development that I want to talk about and really think that is worth discussing. So one of the things that I think is really interesting is the old saying uh, that the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. So the future of uh, learning and development and of what we're doing with education is already upon us, which I think is really kind of exciting and really something that uh, we can wrap our heads around as we start to think about the future and what the future holds. So let me go ahead and with that preface, I'm going to uh, share my screen and uh, talk about some of that information. So let me uh, go there here and here, great. So as I said, uh, William Gibson said, the future is already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. So what does that mean? What should we be talking about? What do we want to discover? Well, one is we want to talk about how do we identify the trends that are going on? Far too often, I see trends as technology. Oh, a trend is VR. Oh, a trend is uh, at one point, in fact, somebody said, uh, oh, 
when the Apple Watch came out, they said, oh, now we're going to have watch-based learning. And I'm like, well, what are we learning on our watch? Like, why are we doing that? So sometimes with education, we tend to follow the technology and not what really is happening. So then I also want to talk about, like, how do we prepare for the future of educational technology? How do we, as instructors, as and as an instructor, I also feel as a student. So how do we go about doing that? And then finally, how will we teach in 2030? What is that going to look like? So one of the things that I think we should think about are converging trends. And I think there's four major trends that we really should be thinking about. And they're, they're large forces in the world around us. So one is the world of science. And learning and development really has started to dig into the science of learning. Sometimes you hear the term neuroscience. Sometimes you hear about um, what scientific discoveries in terms of learning. And some of it's really old. Like if we go back 100 plus years, we have something called the Ebenhauser forgetting curve. And that he showed that we forget things over time. So some of the science is brand new and some of the science we can now start to implement in different ways. Of course, I already mentioned technology. It's always new. There's always something on the horizon. But the other thing I think that's interesting is institutional structures. A lot of the structures of institutions that, that we're used to, at least here in the States, are starting to change. And even before the pandemic, people were talking about, well, what's the history of um, or, I'm sorry, what's the future of an academic institution? <clears throat> when we have organizations like Google running their own programming camps and large consultancies hiring people without college degrees because they say they don't need them, what is the structure of the institute starting to look like and how is that going to impact education? And finally, all the crazy things going on in society. And if we look at all of these, I just picked out some things that are happening. So in science, we're looking at things like, um, things like, uh, uh, um, yes, you can absolutely record, um, things like distributed practice, storytelling, engagement, all of those interleaving, all of those are part of the science of learning. And then if we look at technology, some of the things that I think are really interesting are the concept of big data. So we're starting to, with ed tech companies across lots of institutions, collecting lots of data about students. And so if we're collecting all this data about students, now we've got this large data, we can start to do some statistical analysis. We've got things like virtual reality. Um, one of my favorite is, um, artificial intelligence, how's that going to impact learning and development and what we're doing uh, in um, educational settings? And then shrinking devices. So, um, you know, phones are getting smaller, computers are getting smaller, but even devices that we use to have sensors or um, glasses are getting smaller, you know, uh, goggles are getting smaller, augmented reality. So we have all of that and all of those things. And then You've got things like in society, the worldwide pandemic, but we also have things like the digital divide. So we've got some people who are very rich in technology and some people who don't have technology at all. And that's not just across countries, but in the United States, for example, we've got many people who don't have internet access, even in the country uh, as big as the United States. And then climate change, we're all facing that and trying to figure out how that works. Social unrest, constant connectivity, um, meaning constantly uh, uh, people are communicating with us and trying to give us or take from us information. And then you have the institutional structures with increased complexity, um, cost reduction. As I mentioned before with the Google example, we've got increased competitors. Um, I teach instructional technology at the graduate level at a graduate school, and there are independent consultants who are teaching instructional design. And they say, you know, why go to graduate school when you can learn it from me in less time and less money? So 
my institution has new competitors. And then distributed delivery. Um, with COVID, it's very, very, um, <clears throat> very apparent that it's become very much to the forefront in that we don't, I, we have a campus in Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania, where I teach and there's no students on campus. Excuse me, there are students uh, spread across uh, the country who are taking classes in Bloomsburg. There are students in Bloomsburg taking classes in Bloomsburg, but they're distributed. And so now our delivery has to be distributed. Some of our students come to campus just for a lab, but all their other courses are virtual. So all these forces are coming together and it's the convergence of these forces that lead to trends. So one of the takeaways I want you to have from this presentation right away is that when you, when someone asks you about trends or you think about trends, I want you to think about these four large elements that come together to shape the trends and to shape what's happening. So let's take a look and dive a little bit deeper into some of these. So for example, one of the trends in the future is breaking from the four walls of the Learning Institute. <clears throat> and one of the things that's doing this is this thing called micro learning. So micro learning is a way of delivering content to learners in very small specific bursts over time. So rather than you to like when I first started in instructional technology, we literally had laser discs and we were delivering four, five, six hours of online instruction at a time. Now it wasn't internet, it was on a big laser disc that you put into a big laser disc um, uh, piece of machinery and it would read all that laser disc, which was really interesting, but it was a lot of time. People don't have that time anymore. People have smaller devices. So this micro learning comes from the trend of distributed practice, shrinking devices, distributed delivery, and constant connectivity. So let's look at these four items that support this concept of micro learning. And micro learning is growing. In fact, it's expected to reach $4.6 billion industry by 2027. So that's a really large chunk of the global industry. And let's take a look at one specific example. This is an example from, um, um, <coughs> uh, I'm sorry, from uh, um, Google called Primer. So this is a Google product. And imagine if you're teaching in, in business school. So all of a sudden Google has created a course that you can carry around, you know, in your pocket that teaches you how to market your business with word of mouth. It tells you how to advertise. It tells you a lot of things. Now, it's of course Google centric because they want you to use Google search engine and all that kind of stuff. But let's take a look at this course, this mobile course that's breaking any walls and see how it works. So the title of this course is called <coughs> Get People Talking About Your Business with Word of Mouth Marketing. And it gives you your learning objectives in the form of questions. What is word of mouth? Why do it? And how can it be helpful? And it's got these nice little cards and I can pin this card. If I think this is a really important piece of information, I can pin that information and have that accessible to me in my hand whenever I want to. So it gives me some information. This is traditional. This is almost like a slide. It tells me about search engine marketing and third party websites and all that great information. But as I go further, it asks me questions. As hard as you paid, as your paid marketing works, what are some, you know, customer, uh, what do customers tend to prefer real unpaid opinions? Let's see how many do this. And then it gives you example, 92% of customers trust recommendations from friends and family and word of, so now it's kind of interacting with me. Uh, it's asking me questions. 
I'm giving answers. It's looking at it. Now it gives me an exercise that I need to do. Again, just like an instructor. Now that you know it, let's take a minute to imagine your best customer. So now it's walking me through the process, not in a classroom at all. And then they say, okay, you're imagining your best customer. How do they make you feel about your business? How does your best customer make you feel? And then you pick up your phone, you type in, oh, the customers make me feel excited. My best customers make me feel excited. Then you can skip this activity if you don't wanna do it. But then really interestingly, all these words in blue are words that I typed in to my course, if you will, with my micro learning with Google Prime. And so I wrote, are always excited about the product weekly. I wrote, they make me feel excited. I wrote special discount. I wrote, make them feel wise. That's all me. So this is my statement that this program primer has collated for me, has summarized for me, and then spit it back out or given it back out to me. And I can save that. And now at the end of the lesson, I can scroll through my takeaways as a reminder. So think about that. How many times have you gone to an academic class and at the end of the class, you got a reminder of key takeaways? Mostly it's you taking notes, but sometimes you can get these key takeaways. And notice what it includes in the takeaway, what I wrote earlier about my excited customers. And also, remember when I said I could pin those cards? I can put them right there. So that's breaking the four walls of the classroom because I'm no longer bound by an instructor interacting with me. I'm interacting with this little program on my smartphone. Now, I want to impress upon you one other thing that I think about the future of learning when I look out <coughs> to 2023, the future is almost always and. Like we like to think of it as or. So are we gonna have classroom instruction or are we gonna have online instruction? Actually, we'll have both. So this will be very helpful in some areas but then maybe I will come to a small group discussion in class or via Zoom, and we'll talk about what I put for my customers being excited, what you put for your customers, and we'll compare notes and we'll discuss, and that will help us think more deeply than just this particular online in your pocket course. Now, also though, I think the future is going to be really interesting in terms of analog going digital. So what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is that a lot of traditionally analog processes, and I'm gonna show you one here in a minute, have gone uh, digital, which I think is really, really kind of interesting. So here, for example, um, I tell the story, uh, back in March of 2020, uh, I created a digital card game. And the digital card game that I originally created was called Zombie Sales Apocalypse. And it was about building selling skills and don't become a zombie when you sell. So I went to a company and I said, hey, I have this game to reinforce sales skills. Are you interested? And they said, well, we're interested in reinforcing sales skills, but we're not interested in zombies. Come up with a different game or title. <clears throat> so then we had a title called Customer Engagement and then Customer Engagement Digital Edition. But this is a way to engage students, learners, and others in because we can't do the physical card game very well because <clears throat> we're not allowed to get a lot of people together. And as you may know, the United States is doing a, a really bad job of fighting um, the virus. So um, we are going to um, have a digital version. So here, for example, is a digital version. And one of the nice things about the digital version is uh, of a card game is there's a whole back end to it. 
So uh, remember how I talked about data, digital data. This provides us with the rich big data on the back end. And so I would want to play a game. I'm going to play a game called <coughs> Sort It. And I can look uh, through my different games. And these are all the games that you can create uh, in this um, analog version of a card game. And we'll go ahead and we'll invite uh, myself to this game. And I'll show you how the game is played, how the game provides information. But the neat thing about this dashboard and all the games is it's a very easy to set up so that you can uh, constantly um, add, change, or uh, modify existing games. So it sends you an email when you become invited to the game. So we're going to look for the email. And here is the email. And we'll go ahead and we'll click on the email. And what this will do is it'll ask me my name and then my department and then my job role as a student. And now I have a digital card game. And the neat thing about this digital card game is lots of people could play this digital card game with me. But let's say I'm assessing my instructional design skills. Uh, I do this for my students in my class. At the end of the semester, I ask them to sort through the skills that they believe they've learned in the program. And <clears throat> you can set up as many different categories as you want in terms of strength, secondary skill, weakness. You can have up to seven areas where you sort. And when you click, it basically deals out the cards. And I can say, hmm, my strength is my ability to network with others. Knowledge of how to create an instructional video, I think that's OK. Podcast, mm, secondary skill. I'm not very good at evaluating the effectiveness of learning. So then I can continue to deal out the cards. So this gives me a sense of playing a good old fashioned card game, but with the added benefit of the digital back end. So again, once I play the game and I go to sort it, I can then search on, let me see how everybody did. This is a different game, but I can see uh, how many people said yes, how many people said no. Most people did not sort that game, so maybe that's not the best one to look at. Maybe we'll come down <laughs> here, excuse me, to uh, another game and see what everybody did. Uh, I'm trying to find a good game. So here's one on branding. I can view the results. I can see oh, one person, oh, nobody's sorting these games. But that gives me information as well. Hey, I assigned this to my students and nobody's sorting the game. I need to look at that. So this is, I think, a really interesting, to me, trend in that we're taking traditionally analog things that we play, you know, sitting around the table with our friends, and now we've digitized these experiences. So we're taking traditional experience and digitizing those. And it's not just uh, that sorting card game. Here's another card game as an example. So one of the things that a lot of teachers like to do, professors like to do in their classrooms is you incorporate scenarios where students have to kind of act out how you would deal, you know, maybe with a medical emergency or maybe with an upset patient or maybe with a distraught parent or something like that. So this game you would play in something like uh, Zoom and uh, you would have up to eight different players. So you would have up to eight, I have a bug flying around here. So you'd have up to eight different players. And uh, one player would flip a card and they would have a scenario on the card. Like maybe the scenario is um, uh, an upset parent has just brought their child in with an injury. How would you handle that? How would you handle the parent? So I might say, oh, um, I, I, I I can feel what you must be going through. It's horrible. Um, I understand that <laughs> you're very upset. Here are three things that we're doing to try to help your child. And then once I'm done, I say, yep, I'm done. That was my scenario. And then the other players would either say, yeah, good job, Carl, thumbs up, or mm, bad job, thumbs down. Or they could challenge my answer. They could say, 
I don't like that answer. Add something new to your answer or say it a different way or let me try. And what that does then, it is allows that player to have another opportunity to try to respond. And if that player responds correctly, they win the challenge. If the challenge, the person that challenged <laughs> did a great job, they win the card. And you can see every card you win goes into the leaderboard. So now, not only do you have a game where you can sort cards, but this particular game lets me interact as if we were sitting around the table talking to each other. And it takes some of the problems with traditional role plays. So for example, if you're doing a role play in front of the classroom, the two people in front of the classroom are involved in the role play, but what's everybody else doing? Are they listening? Are they paying attention? Are they taking notes? Are they looking at their phone? But here, because I may want to challenge, I may want to do something differently, I am paying attention. I am focused on what's happening in the front of the room. So that's an area I think that's really kind of uh, important. Now, uh, it's not limited to just card games. This is a board game and it's called Total Recall after uh, Total Office Call. So this is a physician's office <clears throat> and you can see uh, there's a procedure room, there's an examination room, there's a waiting room, and there's two characters, sometimes called meeples, on the game board. And we would play this with five other players, all in Zoom, and we would all have our own character. And we would click on the character, and each of these rooms would have a different card in terms of what I would want to do on the card. Maybe I would want to examine the patient. Maybe I would want to have the patient wait in the waiting room. Maybe I would want to talk to the receptionist. Maybe I would want to run a battery of tests. Whatever I wanted to do, this board game would allow me to pull a card and say, oh, I want to run a test, or I want to talk to the receptionist. And each card is scored. And the winning cards, if I did the right thing in the right office, if I did the right thing but in the wrong office, that wouldn't count. But if I did the right thing in the right office, I would be rewarded with points. And it, it gives you the sense, and, and we've done versions of this with, um, with uh, dice. So you could like roll the dice and have some dice and those types of things. So it gives you the sense of sitting around the table playing a game together, even though you're not around the table or playing the game together. So this is the um, advantage that you could have in this type of environment. So that's the trend, that's the second trend. So the first trend is breaking down the four walls of the classroom, and this trend is turning analog digital. And the other thing I wanted to mention about the trends, they're, they're, they're kind of stackable. So think of it this way. <clears throat> if we're breaking out of the four walls of the classroom, you know, well, we have that course, that primer course with uh, Google, this extends it. It doesn't, so the Google course, the issue with that was I had to, I, I, I did that course by myself. I answered how excited I was about the client or the customer and put that information in there. <clears throat> but one of the things that we as humans like to do is we like to interact with other humans. It's, it's, it's one of the things that really makes us human. So an environment like this doesn't just break the four walls of the classroom, but allows for that social interaction that we typically have in the classroom to be relived. Now, I am definitely, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm definitely not one person to say, well, this replaces the classroom because nothing replaces sitting across from someone and, and looking at their face or reading their body language or hearing that slight, huh? You know, or hmm, or, hesitation in their voice like you, you we it, it's it's you can't reproduce that digitally but in times that we have the pressure from the pandemic and being apart we can get closer and that's what i think is going to happen in 2030 we're going to get much closer 
to the social aspect of sitting around the table playing a game and breaking the four walls of the classroom than we ever have before. So that's another thing that's happening. And here's that sorting game that I showed you before and the dashboard so I can track all the information. And again, that's an advantage we don't have in the classroom. We don't have the ability to track everything that's going on. And, and tracking games and gamification, even before the pandemic, was predicted to be a $30 billion industry, much larger than evil, even e-learning, or I'm sorry, micro-learning. So pretty big, pretty big in industry in 2025. It's, 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 it's pretty large. But there are other aspects to it as well. Whoa, 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 <clears throat> as well. So one of the other interesting things I think that is happening. So we had this kind of course that we took and now we had some interactive games, but <clears throat> what we're missing is the coach or the instructor or the mentor who sits or stands right beside you and guides you through the process, right? The first thing we saw was kind of, it was still a course, a game's kind of fun, but doesn't have that. So now we are gonna have these instructors or mentors or coaches right on our phone, right in our pocket. So what trends support that? Well, I think distributed practice being all over. Artificial intelligence is gonna play a large role in this as well, as well as the increasing complexity, the interleafing, and interleafing means <clears throat> practicing small bits of skills all together. So for example, let's say that you're learning to play uh, foot, European football, soccer. Well, one way to teach soccer is to have the players just practice kicking the ball with their right foot. Kick, 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 kick with your left foot, kick, 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 then do a little bit of dribbling, then maybe do a, a free throw, you know, a throw in, um, <clears throat> one skill at a time, focus on that skill, then move to the next skill. But there's some research that shows that's not really the best way <clears throat> to learn skills. Maybe the best way this research is saying is we should practice a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit of everything all at once. So practice with your left foot, then your right foot, then kick the ball, then dribble the ball, then do a throw in, then kick with your left again, then kick with your right, then kick with your right, then kick with your left, then throw in, then throw in, then kick, then dribble. So actually they're saying is all the elements that you actually do all mixed together is better practice than just working on one element, one element, one element. So this tool allows us to do this. So this is a tool and there's lots of tools like this. This, this one happens to be from a company called Present R, like presenter, but with an R. And it's basically teaching you how to give a good presentation. So there are other ones. There's a company called LeadX that has one for managers and things like that. So I'm most familiar with this particular one. So I wanna learn, for example, how to become a better presenter. How do I present more effectively? Well, I need to practice. I need to practice several things, my pacing, I need to get rid of words like um and ah uh, and words I say over and over again. And I need to make sure my volume is at the right level. <clears throat> so those are all the elements that go in, this is interleaving, all the elements that go into making me a good presenter. So it'd be great if I had a coach who could watch me present, give me feedback, maybe view me presenting, give me feedback, but I can't always have a coach with me. So this app replaces the coach. So what happens is I say, hmm, I wanna present. So I click on present and then it goes, okay, are you ready to present? Cause we're gonna record you doing a presentation. I'm like, yeah, okay, I'm up for it. Let me uh, hit the record button. And then it says, well, what do you wanna talk about? You know, are you just practicing in general or do you have something specific? And actually, ironically, if it's specific, you say no topic, and I'm just gonna practice. So you click on that and it gives you a little bit of countdown and then go. 
and then you do your presentation. So you talk into your phone as if you were presenting and give the information. I'm looking down at my phone, talking to my phone as if I'm presenting, giving that information. And then when I'm done, it asks me to reflect on my learning experience. So it's always a really good idea as a learning professional <clears throat> to encourage students and learners to reflect. In fact, I believe there's no learning without reflection. There's only experience. So if you go ahead and you practice presenting and then reflect on how you did, that helps. But that's not the only thing. That if, if that was it, we could do that with, with anything. But what the tool does is it gives you an overall score on how well you did. In this case, I just did 56%. And then, so what does that mean? Well, it breaks down my score into volume, pacing, and these filler words, um and ah uh, and hmm, those kind of words. <clears throat> so now I have this little tool in my pocket it's given me an overall presentation score because I've practiced everything together. But then it says, hmm, your volume was pretty good, kind of in the middle. Your pacing, not bad. Your filler words, not bad. But I have opportunity for improvement. So then it says, OK, uh, what filler words did you happen to have? And I can click and see my filler words. I used um and ah two times and I used so a couple times. So the tool is actually coaching me to get better and better as I go through this process. So this is a good way to think about how you can become better. So the other thing I wanna think about is this isn't just for presentations. So imagining, imagine maybe, uh, patient diagnostics, patient health care, well, what we call in the States wellness, right? Uh, maybe every day I get up and it's a coach that says, hey, Carl, time for you to go running today. You need to get your exercise. Or a couple times a day, maybe it could remind me, hey, Carl, don't eat potato chips while you're watching TV because you'll eat the whole bag. Carl, get up off the couch and go exercise. And then it can evaluate how well did Carl exercise. So now we have these intelligent items that we're carrying around with us. So our, so one of the things that I think is exciting, but also a little bit scary, is that as instructors, professors, and teachers, we're not just going to be teaching directly to students. We're going to have to think about how do I take my knowledge of how to diagnose a patient, or my knowledge of how to give a presentation, or my knowledge of how to write a paper, and codify that into language that someone can put into an application. So part of our role in the future is going to be thinking about making our knowledge tangible in applications just like this. So I think that's really kind of interesting. And, and for this one, I think is really interesting too. So we had these um, filler words like um and ah and hmm, but also power words. So if you want some to make sure somebody says laparoscopic surgery or somebody says abrasion or laceration or uses the right terminology, you can program that in and it will count how many times you use the correct power words. So I think it's really kind of interesting as we look at um, what's gonna happen in the future in terms of us being instructors. Now, the last thing that this app does, which is pretty helpful is, so I've gone through the presentation, it's measured how quickly I've done, how loud I've done. Let's say I wasn't loud enough. Well, it gives me some games to practice with my volume. And it will give me feedback on how well I did with volume or pacing or whatever. So it not only it, does it do interleaving, but it does break apart the individual skills and say, okay, Carl, you need to peg that needle in the sweet zone 
for 30 seconds or 40 seconds, and it'll go up every time as I practice my skills. So having an instructor in your pocket can be a really powerful tool. And I think one of the things that we as educators need to think about. Now, another interesting thing is the sense of um, artificial intelligence. So now we have this tool here to help me practice presenting, but could I have a tool that would help me when I'm with the patient or practice physiology or anatomy or something like this? So this tool I think is really kind of interesting. This is a tool that asks me questions and then interacts with me. It's a chat bot. It's a medical chat bot. And the cool thing about this is it can be done on your phone digitally through text or as an Alexa app. So we can actually put this into Alexa and Alexa can talk to us through this process. So we might, the system might say to us, what is the nature of your injury? Is it torn skin or is it a cut into the skin? And I can answer, I can say it's torn skin and the system, the artificial intelligence will say, well, if it's torn skin, this is an abrasion. Is the patient experienced pain or swelling? Well, uh, swelling, okay. So dress the wound, place ice on it and take the temperature because we're checking for infections. So this simple dialogue though is an exercise of how a professional can get information about a medical situation. Now, this is very simple, right? Torn skin, abrasions, swelling, et cetera. But you can imagine getting much, much deeper for maybe diseases or symptoms that the physician doesn't see very often. Or if the physician's not available, could someone else in the medical practice help with this information? At least point in the right direction through a chat bot. So I think education, and imagine this for practice, right? I've got a test coming up and I need to practice about abrasions and um, uh, uh, cuts and uh, those types of things, right? Lacerations, abrasions, et cetera. So I pop it up on my phone and as I'm waiting in the grocery store or riding in a, a, a car, I can look, not driving, but riding, riding in the car, I can look up this information because of these converging trends that comes up with an instructor in my pocket. So a couple different ways to think about instructors in your pockets, and there are many more as well, but these are two that I think are, are interesting. Now, another thing that's happening, and a lot of people talk about this, and uh, I think it's really interesting, but it's the idea of immersive practice. So there's actually, I mentioned laparoscopic surgery before, there's actually some research to show that physicians who play video games are actually better at laparoscopic surgery than physicians who don't play video games, which makes sense. Laparoscopic surgery is, you know, you run the camera down through. So it's very much like a video game. But what other types of learning could we provide in this immersive space? What other teamwork could we foster? Feedback could we help? So the trends here, I think, are virtual reality, which is definitely a trend. Storytelling, social unrest. And what do I mean by that? Well, many years ago, I went to Mexico to do some work. And uh, in the e uh, on the way to work, there were riots in the streets. The teachers were rioting for um, uh, unfair pay. And uh, we weren't able to go to the place that we were supposed to do the training because all the uh, roads were cut off. So social unrest. So we actually um, got on a conference call and kind of did the instruction that way. But imagine if we had had virtual reality and could have done it in a virtual environment. And of course, this cuts down on costs because I can have a virtual cadaver, I can have um, a virtual accident, 
I can stage a virtual accident and not have any real costs involved in terms of actors and things like that. So let's take a look at some of what we can do in virtual reality. Now, there are several ways to do virtual reality. You can do 360 video. You can do kind of um, software gaming programming. And we're going to look at a gaming example here. <clears throat> um, and there's me doing some virtual reality, looking at a cell and uh, a colleague of mine looking at a heart. But one of the things that you can do in virtual reality, which is really interesting, is you can pick your character. So your character can be exactly like you or your character can be nothing like you. So imagine if you were trying to teach medical residents empathy for older patients. You could instantly make that medical student older in virtual reality. You could give them gray hair, but you could also dim their eyesight a little bit, maybe turn down the volume so they can't hear as well. If we used haptic devices, we can make it harder for them to walk. So we can provide really empathetic environments as we create this instruction. But here we can walk around, uh, in this case, a medical clinic and interact with the medical personnel. And we can talk to uh, everyone in there, ask them questions. They can ask us questions. We can take a look and see what might be happening in that environment. Here you can walk around in a 3D environment talking with coworkers. You can score points for doing certain things or going to certain areas. You can avoid wrong behavior. So you can immerse yourself in this environment and make all the mistakes that you want in a safe, non-threatening space. And that becomes really important as we're training people to do things. But even more important is on the back end, as I showed this before with the simple card game, with even this little more complex environment, I can start tracking actions and behaviors that are tied to a behavioral model. So if I believe there's a certain way to behave with a patient or to diagnose a patient, I can create a model of that behavior. And here's a model for empathy. So in order to show empathy, you need to engage with the person. But in order to engage with them, you might have to uncover needs. You might have to do an opening with them. You might ask them questions about their environment or what they're experiencing. Then you're going to converse with them. And in conversion, you have critical questions, feedback, finding out what their objectives are, what are they doing, and then you might close out your empathetic conversation, right? So you have different elements of the model and then you have sub elements of the model. Well, what you can do in a virtual environment or a 3D branching environment is you could link those elements to conversational elements. So here, for example, is engage from the model, right? Engage, <coughs> but here we have a rubric of good better, best. So one of the responses here is good, one's better, one's the best. And as a learner going through this virtual environment, I can have an interaction with non-player characters. There's not another person there. That's a, a character that's been created. And based on my answers and behaviors, you can start to see what my behavior is and see where I need more instruction. So for example, all these behaviors are linked in the back end through something called chat mapper. So this right here, hello, Chris, it's nice to meet you. I apologize. I only have a few minutes to talk actually is what he said, this character. And then this is what I respond to the character. And it goes through a very, very deep, can go through a very deep branching dialogue as it goes through and you know you can color code it the right answers the wrong answers the good better best answers but the nice thing is at the end of that interaction or all of those interactions i can see what the learner's response was here it's 
incorrect because it's in red. I can see what the correct response was. And then I can see what feedback should be given to the learner. So I, as the instructor, after you come out of virtual reality, I can give you feedback on how you did. And I can see what element it's linked to and the level of the rubric. So now I'm getting really deep, rich information on every action the learner has taken. And I think this is gonna be uh, a, a, an important element of a lot of online learning. And as we move to that in 2030, we will have these tools as instructors to diagnose what our students are doing in these virtual worlds. So we'll get some insight. Here's another example. Here is uh, data about 17 students and how they did at each level of the model. So you can see here red is foundational knowledge yellow is deep knowledge and green is advanced knowledge, which means those who know the most. So I can look here and I can say, hmm, uncovering needs, six people only had foundational knowledge. I want them to have advanced knowledge. In critical questions, I can see three people have deep knowledge, nine people have advanced knowledge, but only five, but five people have critical, uh, only have foundational knowledge. And I can drill down, I click on it, and I can go deeper and find out who did what? So I've covered up their names, but you know, here are the names. And then I can see, oh, 67%, not very good. 33%, not good at all. Let me see that person. So then I can go another level deep and I can say, hmm, how did they do? So this allows me to go deeper and deeper into how they did on each element of the model. Now, one thing I will definitely highlight is this means you better have a good model. This means as an instructor, we need to think about what are the models upon which we teach? Are they models from textbooks? Are they our own models of how reality works? What models are there? And that becomes important to consider and think about. And the other interesting thing about these kind of tools is they're going to go across devices. So if you don't have goggles, you could look at it on your phone. If you don't have a phone, you could look at it on your laptop. So the technology is no longer gonna be constrained by one physical device or another. So I think that's kind of interesting as well. We're gonna have lots of software experiences that are gonna go across items as well. So, Another trend that I think is interesting is this real time, what I call guided instruction. So if you think about the absolute best way to teach somebody, I think it's an apprenticeship. That was a really pure way to teach something. The problem with apprenticeships, however, is that they're not scalable, right? In order to do a good apprenticeship, it has to be pretty much a one-on-one -on -one relationship. And so that means I need one instructor or mentor for every student. It doesn't work that way. But real-time guided instruction through augmented reality will provide a layer of learning on top of the natural world. So these are the elements of augmented storytelling. I mean, I'm sorry, augmented reality, storytelling. Again, social unrest, I can keep uh, isolated and cost reduction. Again, unfortunately, the world's all about cost reduction. But through augmented reality, I can overlay images on top of reality. So this gentleman wearing his glasses can see an issue on a patient's spine. Or uh, this physician can take a look at the x-ray of a patient and look at the anatomy of uh, maybe a healthy female patient and decide what's wrong with this patient and look at that information and provide feedback. All glasses, she ha ha doesn't have to carry around a computer, doesn't have to carry around, and it's overlaid. So the good thing about this is that's an actual x-ray of an actual person. It's not a fabricated digital approximation 
that's the woman's x-ray. So that becomes really kind of important. And I think, you know, glasses are, are good, but eventually, and, and, and they're working on it right now, are contact lenses that will put this information in your eye without even having to wear glasses. So we have the technology to provide augmented reality in a medical situation or a classroom situation almost anywhere. So now, if we do this right, we can give step-by-step -step instructions on how to deal with an injury. And what this does is it democratizes medicine. So now some setting of bones or those types of things can be done by people who are being walked through the process. So really kind of interesting, I think, of the te technology. And imagine from a learning perspective, if you're trying to learn anatomy and physiology, you could look at your own arm and you could see your bones in your arm or your blood vessels really kind of exciting stuff. So to bring this all to a close and open it up for questions, what we really need to think about when we consider the future of educational technology, when we think about what's gonna happen in 2030, I think we need to not think about what technology is gonna be available. Instead, we need to think about What's the convergence of technology, learning science, institutional structures, and society? And how does the mix of all that together lead to what we're doing in the future? So if you really want to get insight into where education should be in the future, we really want to look at a convergence, not one thing, not, oh, the future is VR. Oh, the future is AR. That's not true. The future is the combination of what's happening around us, what the available technology is, what the students are doing, and what our institutions are doing. And I think that's really exciting because we as educators today have the opportunity to shape how those come together. We can create those um, mentors in a box. We can create those classes that are beyond the four walls. We can create the experience of digitally sitting around a card table. So we have all of those uh, tools at our disposal. So those are the uh, uh, comments that I wanted to make and I wanted to thank everyone. And I'm um, sorry, it was a little bit late. Uh, had a little bit of a time change. Uh, thing going on, but uh, very happy to be here. Yeah, wonderful. Wow. I mean, it's it's a great talk. And I think I, I was actually looking at the chat. Uh, participants really enjoyed, Prof, your talk. And Thank you. uh, out of your talk, just to pick um, one thing, I would say like, uh, uh, you know, the future um, is blend of, you know, science, society, technology, and instructional uh, structures. So I really like that. And first time I have actually seen uh, a different definition of micro learning, you know? Ah, <laughs> so <yes>. that's, that's, <laughs> that's great, you know? Like uh, most of, if you Google also micro learning, they say a chunk of small learning, but the way you put it, <laughs> great. So I will open the floor for Q and A sessions. So I would ask uh, all our participants if uh, you would like to ask any question to Prof. Kalka, post in the chat, or if you want to speak directly, please raise your hand and my technical team here will give you the mic. Uh, I, I think I see one question that says, um, do you think that college degrees will still be relevant? Yeah. So that's a great question. I do think, so I like to look at the future as short, long, uh, short, medium, and long term. So short and medium, I would say definitely degrees are going to be uh, valuable. Uh, again, the future, I think it's an or, I mean, I think it's an and, degrees and external knowledge. What I think is going to become really important. So if we think about some of the tools that we looked at to, to diagnose what students are doing, some of those tools are going to be used to diagnose 
at job skills. So you're going to actually come to a job interview, get into virtual reality and do something. And if you do it correctly, you may uh, win the job. If you do it incorrectly, you may lose the job and they might not care about your degree. A number of, of um, companies in the US are starting to not look at degrees. Now it's a small number and they make the big news but slowly over time, degrees will become less and less uh, important. But I think that that's, you know, it's not going away anytime soon. And, and uh, I don't think in my lifetime, college will go away, but I think it will change. I think college will need to be a place of lifelong learning, not episodic learning. Right now, you know, you come together for a few years, you learn a lot, and then you never come back. If college, and, and this is one of the trends that's causing this is the cost reduction. So if colleges or institutions are gonna stay relevant, they have to break out of the four walls of their campus. They have to break out of the four years of instruction and they have to widen it because we live a lot longer than, than after we graduate from college and there's lots of opportunities for colleges to profit from that and benefit us because we keep learning. You know, if you if you're a physician and you went to school 20 years ago, it's a lot different today. And why not continually update that knowledge? Why not have an institution that completely up, continually updates that? So that's my answer on that. Um, yeah, great. Uh, there's another question like, uh, you have given some examples of micro learning in business. Uh, could you please comment on relevance in higher education? Yes, so great, great question. So we know actually from the research that uh, it's much better to learn something by spreading it out over time than doing it all at once. But many classrooms, so for example, my classroom is three solid hours of instruction, Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. Well, what happens on the other days? Are they thinking about my class? Are they paying attention to my class? Probably not. So one of the things that I do is when I teach on Thursday, then the following Monday, I give a small five point quiz. And to me, that's an element of micro learning because we know from the research that having people retrieve information helps solidify the information. So actually the act of retrieving knowledge helps solidify the knowledge. And so I give that small quiz, I, I view that as a form of micro learning, you know, four days after class so that they remember the knowledge and content and information. Another thing that I do is I will send out small instructional videos to my students throughout the week. So rather than teach three hours, maybe I'll teach two hours and have six 10 minute videos or 10 six minute videos that they have to watch for next class, but can watch them whenever they would like. So that's a way to integrate it into higher education. And then the other thing that I think is, let's say that, um, and colleges don't do this yet, but I think it would be brilliant, is some of the things that I learn as a freshman or as a first year student are important all throughout my career. Well, rather than me have to go to all these classes, what if freshman year I got on this subscription-based learning module and I got little five, 10 minute modules of instruction, you know, one at lunchtime, one in the evening, one, et cetera. So it would be the approximate time of being in class, but it would be broken up so I could look at it when and how I would want to. So that's a way maybe to think about using it in uh, higher education. Yes, Prof, there's uh, another question. How do educators push the institution and society be able to embarrass the change? Obviously, policymakers have to be on our side. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, they definitely have to be on our side. And oftentimes they are not on our side. Uh, policymakers sometimes <laughs> can be very slow in making the changes. So I think, I think it's a combination of things. I think one, it's our job to educate the policymakers, which is not always easy to do. Um, 
but also sometimes we as an institution can have influences if we just go ahead and make a small pilot program or a small change almost outside of the bureaucracy or hierarchy of the institution. And I can tell you, so for example, uh, where I teach is one of 14 state universities. So they're owned by the government, the state government. And um, they just announced that they're consolidating some of these institutions because we're not, we don't have the students that we used to. We don't have the support from the state that we used to. So our funding is dwindling. So that to me is a good opportunity to do something different. So when there's a crisis, sometimes if we speak up or if we come to the table with a new and different way of doing things, sometimes that's a good way to sneak that in there because this is an opportunity to make the difference. And then the other thing we have to do is we have to talk to the policymakers and we have to be visible politically. Um, I think if, 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 if this year has taught us anything, it's that we all have a stake in what our governments are doing and, and literally our lives depend on it. So letting somebody else do the policies and run the institutions I think it's no longer a luxury that we can have. We've got to be a force uh, for change within the institution if we want them to survive and we want to see the change happen. So it's not easy. It's definitely a difficult process, but um, we've got to, it, it, we, we now have, I, I think, more responsibility than ever to do those types of things. Yes, Prof. There's another question. What do you think we should buy or develop all this content? Which is the right strategy for medical facul faculties? Wow, that's a great question. So um, that's a great question. Million dollar question, Prof. Million dollar question. <laughs> so the one thing I, I think there are, a, so in the world today, there are more off the shelf tools for medical faculty than ever before. And for some of the basic things, I think bu buying it makes a lot of sense because you know, if you're gonna teach anatomy and physiology, it's pretty much the same no matter who develops it. There's not a, you know, a whole lot of variation. But when you get into things that you think make your course or institution or approach unique, special, and uh, differentiates you from others, that's when I think you might want to do more of your own development and more of your own creation of the content and more of your own control of the technology. Now, I was just talking the other day to a group of designers of instruction and we lamented because it used to be when we designed online instruction, you had an instructional designer, a graphic artist, a programmer, a videographer, you had all these different roles. And then for some reason, at some point, they all came together and one person had to do everything. Uh, not gonna happen. So I think you need to have, if you're gonna develop it internally in your institution, you gotta have the right team to help. You have to have team of developers, programmers, you have to have a team of um, graphic artists, you have to have somebody with the instructional design concepts, all of that needs to be brought together to make that happen. So I think for the basic things, definitely a buy decision. For the more advanced or more unique things, uh, definitely a make decision. And um, <laughs> I've seen, I, I, I went, I, I'll just tell this little side. I, I uh, was working with a company one time and I said, do not develop your own software. It's expensive. It's costly. It never works out. It's, it's been a horrible experience. And so they bought this off the shelf software and it was expensive, horrible, and didn't work. So <laughs> I don't know that I'm the best person to ask. Um, but I think it depends a little bit on the unique situation and, and what you're trying to accomplish. Okay, great. I think uh, you have answered somehow, but it's a difficult and challenging question because uh, it, uh, it depends on the context, right? 
Uh, Prof, do you think a few big institutions will dominate learning once the process has been uh, systemized and can be yeah. customized as required, similar to what happened with Google and information retrieval? That's a, that's a great question. I think in some ways, yes. Um, but I think education is, is to me the most really interesting thing. My, uh, I tell the story, uh, my wife is a microbiologist by training and I'm, you know, educational um, researcher and psychologist. And so every time I say to her, I'm doing research, she just laughs uncontrollably. She's like, you're not really doing research. You're just asking people questions and then writing down the answers. So um, I think that there will be some systemization of instruction, but that um, it will be very minimal and it will be very basic because while there's a lot of algorithms and a lot of information, uh, for example, I gave that the empathy model how do you explain then to somebody, here's your weakness in empathy, just get better or watch this video or re you really need another person to explain some things about maybe your tone of voice or maybe how you look at something or give you an, an analogy or that kind of thing. So I think, I think there will be these tools that will take a lot of the drudgery out, but that will leave educators the ability to really help shape learners. Now, maybe that's uh, aspirational thinking. Uh, maybe that's my optimism. But I don't see, um, so for example, LinkedIn Learning uh, bought a company called lynda.com, which is a video-based learning company for literally millions of dollars. And then Microsoft turned around and purchased LinkedIn to try to do this institutional across the board learning. But um, there's a lot of organizations that don't like lynda.com courses because the courses are all just video based with very little interactivity. Um, there are other standard off the shelf courses that people don't like because they're not this or they're not that. So I think with learning, it's so differentiated compared to you know, some of the Google services and things that were mentioned before that I think maybe some global companies will have a piece of the learning, but I don't see it uh, replacing all other uh, type of instruction. I just, I don't, I don't see it. I, I could be wrong, but that's my, um, my take on it. That's yes. a great question. Yeah. So there's another, I think I, that would be the last question. Any thoughts on co-creation of education, educational technologies with faculty, students, and industry as a partner? I think that's, I think that's wonderful. I, um, at Bloomsburg, we have something called the Institute for Interactive Technologies. And that institute is set up specifically to do uh, corporate student faculty projects. And we did one for the University of Pennsylvania uh, School of Medicine, and we did something on radiology. And so um, I think that there's lots of opportunities. And I think that will be the best educational product because uh, it has the money of a corporation. It has the curiosity and the a little bit of naivete of students. Like, how do I learn this? How do I get that? And, and we can reach the students and then has the expertise of the faculty. So I find that those projects are uh, sometimes the most uh, impactful projects because they bring the right combination. I, I love, like I say to uh, faculty often, because I do a lot about game development, I say, ask your students to develop a game on that subject. Ask your students to develop a game on that topic. Because if you want to learn something really richly and deeply, try to teach it through a game. And so the students in the, in the process of creating the game actually develop knowledge on the subject. And if it's a good enough game, you could use it in the next semester with your next group of students. So I definitely encourage that. I think uh, if you can do that, uh, that's a great combination. 
Yeah, wonderful. I mean, just to summarize your talk, how we are going to teach in year 2030. So I will just uh, pick key points, if you allow me. We need Please. to learn science of learning, okay? <laughs> That's important. We need to break the four walls of our classroom. Practice of mixed skills is very important. Instructor in your pocket, try think of that <laughs> and sure. how we could actually bring in artificial intelligence into like example given by Prof. Kalkup was chatbot. And I really like the uh, example given like contact lenses like, as a screen. So that reminds me data in the air, you know, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and the conclusion slide is there. So we need to look at science, technology, society, and institutional structures. So blend of all these key elements will make us successful in year 2030. I would really thanks and appreciate Prof. Kalka for your time. And it was wonderful talk. And I could see in the chat, very active discussion going on and uh, really participants excited, uh, enjoyed your talk. And once again, thanks. Over to MC, Norol.